Kalimera y Kalispera. Wherever you're zooming in from, and do take a moment to tell us where you are via chat, welcome to the third and final lecture of the 2021 Archaeology Lecture Series, co-sponsored by the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture, the Pan-Laconian Federation of the United States and Canada, the Coatesan Institute of Archaeology at UCLA, and the Archaeological Institute of America, Los Angeles County Society. Today, you will have the pleasure of listening to two of the most interesting young scholars working in classical Greek archaeology, Drs. Stavros Vlizos and Vasiliki Viki Glacho. I'm John Papadopoulos, a professor in the Department of Classics and the Coatesan Institute of Archaeology here at UCLA, and I'm delighted to be your host this morning, afternoon, or early evening. Now, before I introduce Stavros and Vicky, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the microphone Theodoros Pavlakos, the president of the Pan-Laconian Federation of the United States and Canada. Theodore. Thank you, Professor Papadopoulos. Uh, good morning, California. Good day, New York. Good evening, Sparta and Greece. Uh, on behalf of the Palaconia Federation of the United States and Canada, I greet all participants and I wish you well. I welcome the two professors from Greece, Dr. Vizos and Dr. Vlaku, and I thank them for the important lecture of the Sanctuary of Apollo Amicleos at Sparta and the current research project. I'd like to thank the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center of the study of Hellenic culture for the courteous invitation to our Panlaconia Federation to co-sponsor this great virtual lecture, and especially Mrs. Professor Sharon Gerstel, Professor of Byzantine Art and Archaeology, Archaeology and uh, Ms. Uh, Ellen Evaristo for their excellent collaboration with us. Many thanks to the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation for the many important contributions and projects throughout the world especially to Greece and USA. May God rest the soul of Stavros Nyarkos. Our Palaconia Federation of United States and Canada, founded in 1948, has a long history of accomplishing many significant projects. The latest one is the establishment of the Spartan Museum in collaboration with the Center for Hellenic Studies, Pedia at the University of Connecticut, UConn as they know. Uh, thank you all and may God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Theodore. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome two colleagues and old friends. Stavros Vlizos, who will speak first, is a graduate of the University of Janina, who then went on to complete his doctoral dissertation at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. He first worked as a contract archaeologist for the Greek Ministry of Culture from 1997 to 2001, and then at the Benaki Museum, where he was a researcher and scientific associate of the director, the late, great Angelos de Liborias. And he was at the Benaki from 2002 to 2013. It was, in fact, during his tenure at Benaki that I got to know Stavros well when, in 2006, I curated an exhibition on the watercolors of Pete de Jong. In 2014, Stavros joined the faculty of the Department of Archives, Library Studies, and Museology at the Ionian University in Kerkira, where he is an associate professor and where he now lives with his family. He is the, direct, the director of the Amicles Research Project, a member of the Athens Archaeological Society, a corresponding member of the German Archaeological Institute, and co-founder of the Athens Roman Seminar. He's one of a comparatively few Greek scholars whose research focuses on Greece in the Roman period. In addition to his interest in the material culture of ancient and Roman Greece, his research interests and publications deal with issues of the promotion and management of cultural heritage, sites and objects, as well as the importance of ancient sanctuaries through time. Vicky Vlaku studied history, archaeology, and the history of art 
at the University of Athens. Her doctoral dissertation of 2010 was awarded the prestigious GP Economos Prize in the class of Letters and Fine Arts of the Academy of Athens. She's currently a scientific member of the French School of Archaeology at Athens, the Membre Belge de la École Française d'Athènes, the oldest of the foreign schools of archaeology in Greece. Her research focuses on a topic very dear to my own heart, the early Iron Age and archaic Aegean from about 1000 to 600 BC. She's a member of the field work and publication projects at Xomburgo in Tinos, in the Cyclades, uh, at Amicles, Sparta, of which you will hear today, and at Itanos and Anavlochos in Eastern Crete. She's the editor of the volume Pots, Workshops, and Early Iron Age Society, Function and Role of Ceramics in Early Greece, uh, which was published in Brussels in 2015, and a volume to which I also uh, contributed. If you're interested in giving donations to the Amicles project, um, they, uh, Sharon will have information available for you in chat. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Drs. Stavros Flizos and Vicky Blaku, whose lecture today is entitled New Evidence on a Spartan Religious Center, the Sanctuary of Apollo Amicleos at Sparta and the current research project. Pedia Paracalo. This was uh, too much for me, John. I, I'm uh, <laughs> flattered. <laughs> Uh, with this uh, very kind introduction. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, distinguished guests, uh, uh, allow me first of all to thank uh, this uh, wonderful team from the UCLA Kotzen Institute of Archaeology, especially uh, John Papadopoulos, Professor John Papadopoulos, Professor Sharon Gerstel, uh, Ellen Evaristo, and of course, to thank all the institutions involved in this uh, wonderful lecture series on Greek archaeology, the UCLA SNF uh, Center for Study of Hellenic Culture, the Archaeological Institute of America, and of course, the Pan-Lanconian Federation of the United States and Canada, and, uh, Mr. Pavlakos, uh, who is uh, uh, attending the lecture. Uh, so, um, as you can see, um, the picture here. Uh, in the following presentation, uh, yeah, I will move on. Uh, so, in the following in present, in the following presentation, I will focus on the issues on issues of operation of the sanctuary of Apollon Amiklaios, highlighting four main axes of its life through the late uh, the latest findings of the current Amicus research project. Uh, in other words, we will try to identify the special features that, uh, as in every sanctuary, as well as at the Amiklion, define the evolutionary course of the sacred space during antiquity. First of all, by locating the special elements related uh, uh, to the local characteristics of uh, the religion, the references to Apollo and uh, Hyakinth, as well as the Hyakinthia festival. Then focusing on issues of uh, building infrastructure, of the sanctuary, the interventions related to the enrichment of the space with new constructions and uh, any changes that, changes that were caused to the existing monuments will be highlighted. Next, it's crucial to identify through the movable finds the new trends concerning material culture in general, the life of cult practice uh, of cult images, votive offerings and the equipment of the sanctuary. The combination of all the above will certainly lead to the final interpretation of the image of the Amiklion, emphasizing the messages that we were promoted to, that were promoted to the society through the operation of the sanctuary, conveying a special concept of identity and communication. Uh, the identification of the sanctuary of Apollo Amiklion's on the low hill of Ayekiyaki almost in the middle of the Eurotas Valley, was confirmed by the discovery of roof tiles stamped with the name of Apollon Amiklaios. 
and inscriptions found on the hill uh, and in the nearby surroundings. Uh, the present state of uh, landscape responds to the description of Polybius still, uh, that the sacred size, uh, site lays uh, in, the, in an area of extraordinary beauty and fertility, framed uh, by the mountain range of Daigetos to the west and uh, the one of Paranas to the east. The importance of the sanctuary and the associated religious ceremonies of the Iaquinthia is documented by ancient written sources, the most important of which are Homer, Pausanias and uh, Athenaios in the Daphnis of his time. Other testimonia also refer to the cult activity in the sanctuary, which continued into the late imperial period. There are two key references uh, in the ancient tradition that highlight uh, Amiklai and the Amiklion as important places in Laconia. First, the mention in Homer, after which the Amiklions moved in the ranks of the Achaean against Troy. Secondly, it is uh, particularly clear from the detailed description of Pausanias and Athenaios that the importance of the site from the early Iron Age onwards was focused on the cult. Accordingly, the sanctuary of Apollo and Miklaus as a whole and its temple, the Thronos, with its over 10 meter high cult image of Apollo, are among the factors that have shaped, together with the sanctuaries of Athena, Chalkioikos, and the Artemis of Thea, the religious and social life of Laconia and Sparta from the late Bronze Age to the, to the end of antiquity. Today, we will highlight the systematic work of the ongoing Amicus research project, which launched in uh, 2005 under the direction of uh, the late Angelos de Livorgas and aimed not only at carrying out archaeological fieldwork and publishing the results of the excavation, the study and highlighting of all the phases of the sanctuary, including also modern times, but also at delivering to the public an organized visitable archaeological site uh, included into the daily life of the local community. In this uh, slide, uh, exactly this dimension is emphasized since one can locate the course of the works and the recording of each cultural period in the depiction of the sanctuary. The continuation uh, no, excuse me. Uh, what was important for us, especially from the beginning, is uh, the <clears throat> clarification of the stratigraphy. Because, as you can imagine, to uh, start working in an uh, ancient site which was uh, excavated totally three times before us in uh, the late 19th century by Christus Zundas and in the uh, early 20th century by Ernst Fichter. Uh, Adolf Furtwängler and Ernst Buscher uh, was uh, very difficult. Uh, the stratigraphy was totally uh, distracted and um, for us uh, the search for a spot with a clear stratigraphy was, with a clear stratigraphy was of course uh, from the beginning a uh, main target. Now here you can see uh, the places where we spotted this clear stratigraphy. Uh, it's on the south of the sanctuary, outside the perivolos, so the, uh, uh, the wall uh, which framed the sanctuary. So here you can see uh, uh, Buschor's uh, um, uh, section from 1927 and our uh, work from uh, 2019 and 2021, uh, where you can see through the lines the, the clear stratigraphy. Now here, what is the most important for us, uh, you can see the four layers, uh, which uh, uh, starting from one uh, means modern times, one and one A, it's uh, completely modern. And then going uh, to the ancient layers, two means um, a classical Hellenistic and Roman to Byzantine. Third, the third layer three means uh, and the archaic layer with uh, this uh, characteristic reddish soil and for the, let's say, Bronze Age uh, uh, layer, which already uh, Buschor um, uh, um, characterized as Lehmschicht, as uh, the reddish uh, soil mixed with ashes and, um, 
and this um, uh, brown soil. Yes. And uh, now, uh, uh, from these pictures, you can have uh, uh, already the image of what uh, each uh, uh, layer contained. Um, and what is especially important for us is that uh, you can have uh, already the image of the cult practices. Uh, we'll come back later to these images. So, uh, beginning with the new finds, we are uh, moving on to the second phase of Amiklion, the Amiklion 2 phase. Amiklion 1 means the open air sanctuary from the late Bronze Age to the early Iron Age. Uh, so, uh, uh, at around uh, the uh, early 7th century BC, from the late 8th century to the early 7th century BC, a new, uh, the first perivolus was uh, erected uh, uh, together with the Xoanon, the cult statue of, the, of Apollo, and its base, the Bathron, which was uh, at the same time the tomb of Iaginthos. Uh, on the red line, you can see how uh, this perivolos um, covers the south and the east side. And this uh, refers to, um, uh, to sources which mentions that uh, the Amiklion at that time was still a Daskion Alsos, uh, something like a, um, a forest, a small forest uh, on one side with cult uh, activities on uh, the other side. Now, um, what was very important for us uh, is, uh, was the uh, identification of the base of the, <coughs> uh, of the cult statue. Uh, this means that uh, Manolis Cores identified the blocks which were uh, at the top of the hill in a second uh, uh, place, uh, in a place for a second use, and there uh, he uh, defined, uh, he could define the, the shape of this uh, uh, base of the Xoanon, of the cult statue. And uh, here you can see uh, his reconstruction together with the um, coin uh, from the times of Commodus, which uh, at the uh, lowest uh, level shows you that uh, the base was uh, a very uh, uh, important uh, mark for this uh, uh, cult statue. Um, going on uh, with the new finds, uh, the, um, the Perivolos uh, appeared uh, in a, a very strange uh, shape, let's say. Let's say. Uh, here you can see um, how in the south uh, area uh, there uh, was a, um, a parallel wall, so to speak, uh, a parallel wall. Um, which uh, formed an entrance uh, from the south and the east. Um, the construction of both walls are the same. Um, you have uh, two rows, uh, as you can see at the red lines, um, where big rough stones uh, forming the outer and the inner wall, and the in-between was uh, filled with smaller stones. Uh, this uh, wall was uh, uh, embedded on the stepped uh, bedrock. Uh, the bedrock, the natural bedrock, was worked out and formed a step. Uh, what was uh, especially uh, important for us? Uh, I hope you you can you you, will, uh, you are not seeing the, 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 the images of the participants. No, it's good, Stavro. It's good. it's good. So what uh, what was um, very important, very very interesting for us, and surprising me, uh, is the um, uh, <clears throat> the find of the deposit of the sanctuary, uh, the so-called uh, apothetis. Uh, so uh, again, at the south side, uh, to the to uh, outside the Peribolos, we found that deposit uh, uh, area. It was not just. Um, a Bothros, but a whole area, uh, which was totally covered uh, by uh, these archaic miniature um, vases. Uh, so far, we have uh, collected about 4,000 of them. Uh, as you can see here, a very characteristic image. Uh, and uh, we have mainly Aribaloi, 
but also other shapes, as you can see, lichen and um, kardiskoi. Uh, but 90% of, uh, of uh, this uh, material is aribaloi. So um, uh, the total of this uh, uh, material belongs to the archaic layer, what I showed you before, layer uh, three. Uh, immediately below this uh, layer, we uncovered uh, the next layer, uh, which uh, contained material from geometric times and earlier. Uh, what was very interesting here is uh, that uh, uh, mainly metal objects were used. Another indication about the ritual practices uh, for the Amiklion during the geometric times. Um, during our research, we could uh, spot uh, the next monumentalization phase, uh, which uh, belongs to the sixth century and especially the end of the sixth century. Uh, during this phase, uh, we have uh, the erection of the temple uh, sanctuary, the Thronos, uh, the altar of Apollo, uh, a new perivolos was built uh, surrounding the total of the hill. Uh, an uh, additional building, uh, the so-called South Building, and workshops were uh, identified on the hill. But uh, first, of course, first of all, is uh, um, the importance uh, was of course uh, uh, the the Thronos, the temple. Here, um, Themis Bilis and Maria Magnisari could. Um, uh, proceed to a, a proposal uh, based on the study of the architectural material. Uh, as you can see on the sketch, it's a very simple uh, building. We could say uh, it's a store, uh, a T-shaped store and uh, a uh, closed aviton at the back with an open uh, court in the center for the statue, of course, according to the um, to the description of Pausanias, uh, the throne was, was um, erected around the already uh, established uh, statue there. Uh, the next indication and a new find uh, was uh, the um, location of the entrance to the sanctuary and the continuation of the perivolos towards the west slope of the hill. Uh, on the contrary, uh, all the previous uh, um, works on the hill um, <clears throat> proposed an open sanctuary in the horseshoe uh, shape, the U shape, uh, with an open space to the west. Uh, it's clear now from the new works that uh, the archaic perivolos surrounded uh, the total of the hill and had a monumental entrance in the north. Uh, this entrance, uh, with a width of six, six meters, uh, could be um, in a, its a shape like uh, the parallel example from Iria in Naxos. As you can see there, uh, the uh, Erivolos uh, to, the, uh, to the east and to the west continues along the hill. And uh, the entrance itself, the Pili, uh, was roofed according to a, the destruction layer, uh, which were uh, which was uncovered also, and uh, contain, contained uh, fragments, uh, a lot of fragments of uh, Laconian roof tiles from the sixth century. So um, very uh, important for us was uh, exactly this continuation of the perivolos to the west. Um, which showed us that uh, the, uh, the sanctuary was uh, uh, completely uh, covered by uh, this perivolos. And here again, another picture. Uh, at this picture, though, you can see that uh, there is still a corner, the south corner, uh, as an open space. Uh, this um, is an indication that uh, maybe uh, the, uh, the sanctuary continued to the south, uh, what is uh, unfortunately not possible uh, yet to uh, discover because of uh, um, of the archaeological site, because we are framed now 
uh, exactly inside our borders. Um, so um, to have an imagination about this uh, enclosure wall, this perivolos, I, uh, I like to compare it with uh, uh, Athens Acropolis. Uh, we, we could uh, uh, have the same uh, similar image uh, because uh, the perivolos and the Miklaun uh, reached the height uh, of uh, seven meters. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, of course, as you can see, uh, uh, like in, uh, in Athens, a very heavy construction, uh, which was necessary to keep all this uh, uh, inner material um, safe. Uh, another new indication from our works is the so-called South Building at the south uh, corner of the hill. Uh, during the works in 2017 and 2000, uh, 2018, a P-shaped uh, building uh, came to light, uh, forming, um, <clears throat> having uh, a roofed corridor to the north and to the east, to the west, excuse me, to the north and to the west, and an in, inner open court. Uh, we spotted uh, a uh, uh, one unique um, um, base of a wooden column, but uh, in general, it seems that um, this building uh, had uh, a, um, a roofed corridor, inner corridor, and um, a store uh, towards the inner open court. Uh, here you can have uh, the view from the uh, west and from the east, and you can see how uh, this building was uh, very harmonically incorporated into the uh, south slope of the hill. Um, uh, uh, parallel to this, you can see how this uh, building um, was uh, destructed uh, to the south. Uh, we don't have uh, the total of the building, unfortunately, and uh, nobody can assume how the total of the building looked like. Uh, so by now, uh, it's uh, just, uh, as I said before, a, a roofed corridor uh, and an open space, an open inner court. Uh, what was very interesting is uh, the destruction layer at the corridor. Here we had um, uh, various finds, again, from uh, the archaic period, uh, 7th and 6th century. Um, what is very important uh, was uh, this head, uh, this bronze uh, uh, griffon head, and um, uh, this uh, the shirt of the bowl from the sixth century, uh, especially uh, the griffon from a uh, bronze cauldron of the late eighth century. Eighth, uh, century uh, is important, uh, as you can see from parallels from uh, Cyprus. Uh, the other material from this south building uh, indicates that uh, the use was uh, mainly for drinking and dining. We have a mixing cooking bowls um, um, from this uh, archaic, late archaic period. In terms of um, interpretation, uh, the only parallel I could find uh, in terms of uh, shape of this uh, building uh, was the uh, gymnasium of the um, Argive Heraion, as you can see uh, at the slide. Uh, but still, uh, because of the missing uh, south area, it's uh, difficult to proceed to a secure interpretation. Uh, another uh, <clears throat> uh, surprisingly uh, um, find, uh, surprising find found by, by was uh, uh, the uh, where these traces of the metal workshops, uh, temporary metal workshops at the top of the hill. Um, we can assume that, uh, as in Olympia, um, also at the Amiklion, uh, workshops were active, temporary workshops were active during uh, um, the building of the, the main um, construction phase of the sanctuary at the sixth century. Uh, here we can assume that uh, a lot of um, uh, dedications were erected, maybe also 
some of these bronze uh, decoration sheets for the uh, for the thronos. Um, some fragments uh, were indicating uh, this uh, use. And uh, from the same period, a lot of fragments from Peridandiria, this uh, uh, necessary water basins were found. Uh, and uh, this is another indication of uh, the use of this uh, uh, type uh, of uh, water basins uh, at the Amiklion. So um, after these uh, finds, we can reconstruct an image of the late archaic Amiklion, the main phase, let's say, of the, uh, of the Amiklion, according to this image. The procession uh, for the Yakinthia uh, um, went into the uh, sanctuary from the north, where you can see the entrance. Uh, of course, um, the procession uh, uh, could walk into the, um, into the sanctuary because the workshops were uh, covered, of course. Um, the procession passed uh, through the various dedications and the Peirandiria and uh, reached the center of the uh, sanctuary where on the one side uh, the altar was erected and on the other side of course the thronos with the uh, with the cult statue of apollo um, the perivolo surrounded uh, as i said uh, the total of the hill on all the sides so now we are moving uh, uh, let's say a thousand years later to uh, highlight uh, another phase which is very important for the sanctuary. I would say it's equally important uh, to the early phase, the late antique uh, Amiklion. And this uh, because we have indications that uh, at that time uh, a lot of uh, constructions were erected. So the continuation of religious and ritual services at the Amiklion during the High and Late Roman, even the early Christian period, is mainly underlined uh, by the testimonies coming from Athenaios and the later orators, uh, Himerius, Libanius, and uh, Coritius. In terms of infrastructure, it is obvious that the recent excavations offered a good amount of new evidence which changes the picture of the army client significantly. The relevant finds are located on the western slope of the hill, following the extension of the archaic enclosure uh, from the entrance to the south. Two monumental constructions uh, were uncovered, a large cistern, number one, and the noteworthy exedra, number two. Due to the building techniques, and the material used, mainly spoil, and mortar, their formation can be dated in the fourth century AD. Both ancient Greeks and Romans made extensive use of cisterns throughout the Mediterranean uh, to store rainwater used for drinking water in various circumstances. In the case of the Amiklion, it is a large capacity system of four to four meters in length and width and approximately two meters uh, at height that served the community during the biggest religious festival of the Lacedaemonians, the Yakinthia. These uh, 32 cubic meters uh, were fed by 60,000 liters of uh, water and um, rainwater mainly, of course, but uh, if necessary, fresh water from the near Rotas River transported to the hill uh, uh, by the staff of the sanctuary. This uh, masonry oblong tank is built at the worked out ground level of the natural bedrock, like all the buildings of the sanctuary. It had a roof, uh, watered or flat, uh, we don't know, but similar to the sketched parallels you can see at the slide, and the surface of the internal of uh, its thick walls which consisted of two layers, a thin layer, an, in layer, an inner layer in yellow, and a massive outer wall in red, uh, were protected with a waterproof coating. An opening 
at the roof must have existed to allow a person to enter the space for cleaning. In its second phase, the cistern was equipped with a built uh, stairway leading down to the bottom of the, on the east, uh, the side towards the sanctuary, and a small circular uh, uh, clay pit with a Doric capital from the Thronos as its, uh, its lid, replacing the existing water drain in the middle of the west wall. It's dating to the sixth century, stems from the bowl. Um, found inside the circular opening, which according to the uh, feather ruling inside belongs to the African haze form 91C. Uh, excuse me. Uh, these interventions were necessary to clean and maintain the cistern at the end of the operative circle, of its operative circle. This evidence uh, of care put into maintaining the water's purity and in general to secure water supply at the sanctuary required active participation of the community. Uh, the cistern as the primary water source had to be managed constantly in order to ensure that it would fulfill the needs uh, during the Yekinthia. It is expected that large volumes of water were collected uh, here through the winter and spring months enabling people participating at the festival to allocate uh, water intensive activities related to religious and ritual practices during the early summer period in July, the month of the Yekinthia. In almost direct uh, contact with the cistern and immediately south of it, a semicircular exedrum of the fourth century AD was discovered with uh, four, meter in four meters in diameter, carved in the natural bedrock and creating an opening to the east uh, that is towards uh, the inside of the sanctuary. Preserved in situ on the south side of the semicircle are four blocks of semicircular cross section placed in pairs in two successive rows creating a step. The technical details of the block indicate that uh, they are spolia from other circular or semicircular monuments different from each other, where, which uh, pre-existed most probably inside the sanctuary from uh, classical to Roman times. It is most probably that the absidal podium of the exedra supported the stone bench. On the other hand, uh, uh, this freestanding exedra could also support sculpture. Um, Either way, it is uh, characteristically located at the most prominent spot next to the entrance of the Amiklion, that is uh, along the sacred way through which the Yakinthia procession passed by, such as at uh, other known sanctuaries. Archaeological evidence combined with uh, literary sources and historical data allows us to reconstruct the Amiklion during the late antiquity, uh, according to this image. The still surrounded by its uh, perivolous uh, sanctuary kept the basic part of uh, its uh, structure alive. Uh, the temple, the Thronos of Apollo with the cult image and the place for worshipping Iakinthos as its base, the altar, the main entrance at the north and a store at the south, the south building, uh, remained even uh, now, even that time, uh, the main points of reference of the sanctuary. New additions concerned practical needs as well as the way of projecting the importance of educated class. For these purposes, a large cistern and, a, and an adjacent uh, exedra were added at the entrance area immediately after the gate to the west. Last, we can assume that the number of dedications, votive offerings in terms of statues and steles from archaic times on were still assembled assembled uh, in front of the temple and towards the entrance area. Together with the archaeological evidence, uh, the inscriptions bear witness of the importance uh, that the festival of the Akinthia and its accompanying contest played at that time. Um, but uh, after this, I would like to add uh, shortly another aspect of archaeology. Uh, this is public archaeology. So I will um, 
I will concentrate on the earlier Age sanctuary and the beginnings of the Calvin Festival, beginning with the, um, ah, you can begin with a question. So when did cult activity begin on the hill of Hagia Kyriaki and how cult and ritual performance evolved into one of the most important religious festivals of the Spartan polis, that of the Akinthia? Past scholarship had inextricably associated the introduction of the cult of Apollo with an influx of Dorian newcomers in Laconia. After the assumed opposition between the Achaean uh, Amicles and the Dorian Sparta that ended by the annexation of Amicles as the fifth village to form the Spartan polis, Apollo took command over the old cult of the Akinthos at the oldest sanctuary of the area, that of Amicles. Mythological narrations dating to the 6th century BC, explain why the Akinthos was worshipped as a hero. The handsome youth was accidentally killed by the discourse of Apollo. By the late 5th century, we have the earliest mention of the cult and the Panichis by the Evrotas, founded by Apollo in memory of the Akinthos. This comprised female courses and animal sacrifices. According to Adiochus of Syracuse, the Akinthia festival served as the setting for the conspiracy of the Parthenia, an event that led to the foundation of Taras. The signal for the attack by the conspirators was to be given during the athletic contest, Agon, and in the presence of all Spartans who participated at the festivities. Although the historicity of the event remains a matter of interpretation, the foundation of Taras, the only Spartan colony in the West, has been traditionally dated to the late 8th century BC. Later authors, such as Pausanias, mentions two consecutive, although distinct, stages of ritual activity at Amicles, one centered on the tomb of Iachinthos and the other on the altar of Apollo. In the fourth book of Dipnosophiste, Athenaeus quotes at length Polycrates' description of the ritual meal at the Iachinthia. To different types of meals corresponded to two successive parts of the festival, addressed to the Chthonic hero Iachinthos and to Olympian Apollo. The above traditions provide a view of the degree of complexities and transformations of religious practices over time. The ritual mourning of the dead hero and the festivities addressed to the god Apollo that comprised sacrifices, ritual dances, contests, and consumption at the sanctuary area. Yen, yet none antedates the 6th century, a period when the sanctuary seems to have reached the peak of its fame. During this time, the ritual space was almost completely reorganized, as Stavros have shown us before, with the erection of the famous throne of Apollonos and Amicle, that since dominated the hill and the strong Temenos wall that defined the sacred area. On the other hand, any reconstructions of the earlier phases of the sanctuary and ritual activity that is prior to the sixth century lay principally on the archeological evidence. The most recent excavations as presented just before by the director of the new research project, Stavros Bezos, brought to light large quantities of material used and disposed during the ritual activities on the hill. On the plan, the main deposits contain, I have marked the main deposit, uh, the, the deposits of the material of the earlier phases uh, with red. In addition to the findings of the older excavations from the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, it is possible to follow now the early history of the sanctuary and its transformations throughout the early Iron Age, that is from the 10th to the early 7th centuries BC. This period of approximately three centuries shall be our focus for the rest of today's presentation. The earliest evidence of cultic activity is dated to the 13th century and the transition from the late Eladic 3b2 to the late Eladic 3c. This is a time of profound changes in the human and cultural landscape of the wider area of Sparta and Laconia marked by the final abandonment of the Mycenaean installation at Agios Vasilios, most probably the largest 
administrative center of that time in Laconia, and also of the extensive installation units identified and investigated at the Menelayan. The importance of this post-palatial hypethral cult on the hill of Hagia Kyriaki reflects on the associated material remains, large terracotta figures, even if fragmentary, numerous small figurines of the psi and phi types, small handmade animal figurines and larger will-made bull figures, as well as quantities of nicely decorated pottery of mainly sympotic character, currently under study by Vespina Nika, represent the visible remains of ritual activity on the hill in the context of gatherings, most probably as part of a festival with a mainly regional character. Katie Dimakopoulou has argued on the regional importance of this open-air shrine that seems to have been continuously used throughout the 12th and 11th centuries and presumably even entering the early 10th century BC. The Amicleon is among the few sacred places in the Peloponnese where ritual activity was maintained in the earlier age, most probably most recently discussed by Brigitte Eder, who compiled also um, the map that you can see on the screen. On the contrary to the traditional view that considered the sanctuary as abandoned for approximately a century before the reinstallation of the cult at around the mid 10th century, the most recent excavations on the hill of Hagia Kyriaki and the study of the material from the deposits have provided additional data for the use of this area during the transitional period of the late 11th and early 10th centuries. Among the earliest fragments from the deposits, there are some resembling the early protogeometric and middle protogeometric style of Attica and the Argolith, as well as protogeometric style of Ithaca, dating to the Polis II Aetos I phase and largely corresponding to the Dark Age II phase, distinguished by William Coulson for Messenia and Laconia. Although extremely fragmentary, the specimens from the Amiclion represent present stylistic links to the latest figures and figurines of the preceding period, yet already reveal a shiny black paint, grooves and lattice ornaments, and thus marking the beginnings of a long pottery tradition in this area. Even if frequentation on the hill may have been sparse during this period, judging by the small numbers of finds, it seems that the memory of this area as a sacred place never ceased. The large corpus of material dating to the second half of the 10th century points to an apparent increase in the number of visitors and possibly to the rate of visitation. The fine wear assemblage of this period demonstrates a consistently high percentage of small and medium-sized open vessels that should have served as the basic equipment for the communal rituals, the consumption of food, drink, and presumably also for libations. Skifoi, cantharoi, bowls, and manhandled cups are typical. Praters, the vessels linked to the consumption of wine and the convivial drinking, have been, special, have been equally identified. Although extremely fragmentary, they reach large dimensions with a rather deep body and lip diameter that ranges between 30 and 50 centimeters for the largest examples. Overall, the standardization of the ceramic sets, and namely the vessels destined for consumption, their good quality and large quantity, should be considered as reflecting a shared social status and identity of the participants to those early activities. The almost complete absence of cooking ware and of large storage vessels from the pottery deposits may speak against any food preparation on the hill. Other shapes that do not relate to feasting activities include clay boxes or pixies, as the one very fragmentary on your screen, terracotta walls, and miniature handmade vessels that only make sense as dedications within a cultic context. You Small lekithoi are among the commonest closed shapes of the proto-geometric period. Used as oil containers, lekithoi are a common offering to burials, thus related to the care of the dead body. Likewise, small hydriae may have served for libations at the sanctuary. Such artifacts, selected and deposited by the participants to the activities on the hill of Hagia Kyriaki, should relate to the character of the rituals performed at the site, 
of the recipient or recipients of these offerings and equally to the participants to the rituals. The scarcity of imported wares and the rarity of clear external influences in the material remains seem relating to the regional character of the activities on the hill and possibly also to their exclusivity. Cult activities seem to have taken place outdoors around an ash altar, the location of which seems to have been largely under the stone circular and stepped altar of the sixth century. A mixture of ash, pottery, votive offerings, a few animal bones that were found in a layer of black fatty earth in the area to the west and south of the modern church of Hagia Kiriaki seem relating to the earlier altar of the sanctuary. This has been identified by the past excavators on the hill and equally during the most recent works. By the late 10th century, comparable finds have been reported from the Acropolis of Sparta, where the sanctuary of Athena Halkikos was later established, and from the area of Limnes, where the sanctuary of Artemis of Thea was founded. A rich deposit was investigated to the south of the stone crescent as a result of clearing the area for construction on the Acropolis, while a layer of blackened earth to the west of the archaic altar was investigated at the Orthia. The material from these areas is extremely fragmentary and on stylistic grounds post-dates activity at Amicles. And these are among a small selection of the, of the published fragments. There are not uh, many, there are not much. Yet it marks the beginnings of some kind of ritual activity, probably by the communities installed in the vicinity. Indeed, burials of approximately the same period have been investigated in the area of Limnes, in between the sanctuary of Orthia and the Ereon, and the Eron, in the area to the south of the Acropolis, and equally in proximity to the Amiclean sanctuary. Although the settlement areas remain unclear, this is considered to have been in a short distance from the burial grounds. Further to the south of Amicles, in the area of Amphachori, some protogeometric pottery has been reported from the site related to a sanctuary of Zeus Mesapes. It seems thus that around the late 10th and early 9th centuries, these newly founded sanctuaries, in addition to the older cult at Amicles, marked the areas of occupation in the Spartan plain. Further to the south, towards the port of Githion and along the Evrotas, one more site should be mentioned, located in between the modern villages of Peristeri, Solaki, and Phyllisi. Although the site awaits its final publication, there seems to be enough evidence for a continuous occupation concurrent to the evidence from Amicles. Theodoros Spiropoulos and later on Nasos Themos excavated at least two chamber tombs and more planar burials dating from the late Elladic III period. At least one tomb described as sub-Mycenaean or early protogeometric by Nasos Themos was opened in the dromos of the earlier chamber tomb, demonstrating an uninterrupted continuity within this burial ground. The settlement of the same period extended in some distance close to the modern village of Phyllisi, where actually a settlement of the earlier on age was also identified and a pithos burial of the geometric period. Beyond the confines of the Spartan plain, the circulation of Laconian protogeometric pottery, namely the Amiclean ware, following Drup's term of the protogeometric pottery style found mainly at Amicles, has been identified at Assini, according to the publication by Barrett Wells, and to the port of Brassiers, according to Professor Fackleris. Important are the finds from the Arcadian sanctuaries at Aegea and the peak sanctuary of Zeus on Mount Lycaon. If we consider the pottery among the indicators of connections and possibly also intra and interregional alliances built between the communities in this wider area, then early cult places represent the points of reference within these active networks. Yet the existence of a network be between the early cult places is difficult to establish solely on the basis of pottery, as pots may arrive there through various channels um, of contact. On the other hand, the production, exchange, and circulation of other categories of material culture, such as the bronze tripods and tripod cauldrons, provide additional evidence for the existence of networks linking early cult places in the Peloponnese. 
most recent neutron activate, activation analysis of the quite fragmentary tripods deposited in the early Iron Age sanctuaries has confirmed the circulation of artifacts of value among the concurrent cult places. According to Moritz Kinderlen, this type of valuable artifacts should be regarded as markers of political and economic networks based on the activity and mobility of regional elites. Within this framework, one of the two early bronze tripods from the Amiklion, dated to the early 9th century, came from Olympia, thus placing the Amiklion sanctuary within these active networks. The 9th century is largely characterized by the introduction of new shapes in the local feasting equipment and visible growth of non-Laconian ware that reached its climax by the second half of the 8th century. The material from the Amicleon provides valuable information on the local pottery sequence throughout the 9th and early 8th century and has offered evidence for new shapes, such as the pixels that we see on the screen, uh, and small calathoi. Furthermore, new forms of dedication, such as bronze and clay tripods, demonstrate a shift to dedications of greater value and display, accompanied by a larger variety of artifacts, bronze dedications, as those tablets presented to, to us just before, and other imported goods. This mark a significant difference to the homogeneity of material assemblances and ritual practices of the preceding periods. Indeed, the 9th century has been generally seen as a prolonged period of internal struggles, economic pressures, and increasing competition among the ruling families. The settlement of Laconians on Thera and at Taras are among the events that marked the two ends of this period, reflecting contemporary social and economic upheavals. Mikhail Peterson has argued that around the same period, the prestige and power of local ruling elites would have been largely based on the control of the most important cults of the later Spartan polis and the conspicuous display of their wealth and power there. In addition to the Amicleon, the sanctuaries of Artemis Sorthea and Athena Halkiikos on the Acropolis continued receiving a modest number of offerings, among which some bronze ivory, a bone artifacts, and jewelry. Likewise, bronze objects and jewelry were equally deposited with the burials. Tradition places the annexation of Amicles into the Spartan polis by the mid 8th century as the final event in the creation of the Spartan territory through the cynicism of five villages, Pitana, Mesoa, Kinosura, Limne, and Amicles. Yet material evidence cannot be taken as indicative of such an opposition between two culturally different areas, that of Achaean Amicles and Dorian Sparta. On the contrary, comparable forms of dedication and of pottery style, as we have seen already, point to shared cultural and social expressions among the cult places within Sparta and Amicles already by the uh, late 10th century. It seems possible that the importance of Amicles within the Spartan territory related to its seniority and its Mycenaean pedigree, and thus to the political and social role of the aristocratic families that controlled by that time the sanctuary and its festival. By the mid 8th century, figured scenes on the pottery from the sanctuary provide a view into the festivities following comparable developments in most sanctuaries of the Aegean. Repetitive dances of youths and maidens are the commonest. In Euripides Helen, we learn by the chorus members that the, on the event of her return to Sparta, Helen, shall join the choral dances performed in front of the temple of Athena, the Spartan Halkikos, and the choral processions marking the festival of Iakinthia, the great ritual celebration dedicated to Apollo of Amicle and his Eromenos, the young athlete Iakinthos. Among the offerings to the sanctuary during this period, the small bronze lyre represents a unique find, consistent with the deployment of musical contests while the dedication of bronze tripods to the sanctuary further demonstrates the deployment of games as part of the festivities. A fragmentary amphora provides a rare occasion of a battle scene in the Laconian repertory. On the lower register, armed male are fighting with the use of spears, while some are uh, depicted already dead. In the upper register, naked and armed men are shown dancing. As Claude Calam has emphasized, the Akinthia were among the most important civic festivals, along with Gymnopédie, 
which ritually integrated the, Greek, the girls and above all the young men into the different social statuses of adult Spartan. Warfare and civic ideology became inseparable aspects of the Spartan polis. The unique terracotta pair of a male warrior and a female maiden today in the National Museum of Athens, as well as the small bronze warrior figure, figuring from the most recent excavations, embody the Spartan ideology and the role that men and women held in it. From this period onwards, handmade miniature vessels, namely Aribaloi, became the vessels per excellence offered by the participants to the rituals. The quantity of these vessels is indeed impressive. Aribaloi became a common offering in the archaic and classical periods and are studied along with the rest of the archaic material by Christian Majet and my colleague at the French school, Adrienne Delahaye. The early 7th century is equally marked by the first large rearrangement of the ritual space with the construction of the first enclosure wall around the foot of the hill. Uh, we can see it better in this uh, diapositive. Uh, such construction should have been spurred by collective decisions in maintaining and reinforcing aspects of the cult. It seems reasonable then to consider these fixed constructions as the visible outcome of the amplification of the cult and rituals in the context of the Akinthia festival, presumably also related to changes in the cult practice. Earlier scholarship has placed the introduction of the cult of Apollo to the much older festival and cult of the Akinthos at the very end of the seventh century, when the first colossal statue of the god should have been erected. Yet recent archeological data, as discussed above, may support an even earlier date, possibly by the early seventh century. Although tempting, it is certainly difficult to directly associate changes in the material evidence to shifts in cult and religious practice. On the other hand, we should consider parallel transformations that took place elsewhere within the Spartan polis at the turn to the seventh century, namely the remodeling of the Orthia sanctuary or the beginnings of heroic cults at the Menelaion and at the Iron of Alexandra Kansadra at Amicles, among others. Yet, this is another exciting field of research. I will close with this short overview with a reference to the website of the Amiklion Research Project. I think Stavros wanted to mention it before, where you may find all necessary information regarding excavation and research at the site, along with the rich documentation and, of course, our research team. And closing, I would like to address my warmest Thanks to professors Saron Gerstel and John Papadopoulos for their kind invitation in this series of lecture on Greek archaeology of the UCLA and Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Center. And of course, Ms. Ellen Evaristo for all her help in organizing today's event and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for that wonderfully rich uh, presentation. It's just, I think so exciting to see so much new field work happening in this evocative landscape. Um, it's at the Amicleon and of course, at a relatively short distance to the south at the new palace, the new Mycenaean palace um, at Aeus Vasilios, which is replete with linear B tablets. Um, Sparta is really coming into um, its own. We have time for a few questions. Um, so, um, as I said at the beginning, if you would like to pose a question, please do so via the chat function, or please raise your virtual hand to ask one of the speakers directly. And while you're formulating any questions, I have a question of my own. There was a, an extraordinary quantity of those miniature aribolite of the archaic period. I mean, 4,000 in such a relatively small uh, area. Do you have any speculations on what they may have contained? <laughs> I would uh, I would suggest that they were um, directly um, um, connected with the Yakinthia and uh, especially the sports uh, activities of the youth. Uh, since we know through the Diplosophiste that uh, 
the young boys and girls uh, had uh, uh, sports competitions there. So um, I would uh, suggest that uh, they were uh, they, they uh, contained, uh, of course, oil. May I add that some of the miniature ones cannot contain anything. They are really solid inside. And uh, some of the larger Aribaloi too. Uh, we don't have only Aribaloi. We also have uh, some Skifoi. There are also some Cantharoi, some other, some jugs or looking like jugs. But some cannot, did not contain anything. They were uh, dedicated per se, like, uh, like that. But uh, the others, yes, I agree with Stavros. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Nancy uh, Winter, um, Madam Terracottas, architectural terracottas. Uh, and she asks, were there any architectural terracottas found in the excavations of the Amicleon? Some uh, fragments of antifixes, yes. Good uh, archaic uh, antifixes. And, uh, and uh, um, acrocerama, uh, palmettes, uh, palmet decorated acrocerama. Which is interesting. It's good to see you, Nancy. Thank you for your question. Any other, any other questions? Yes, I think one of the, the most, what was going through my mind, um, was actually some of the things that I think Vicky was touching upon at the end, um, which is, you know, looking at this, this greater landscape of the area and how, you know, the city and, you know, Apollo's sister's sanctuary at, at Orthia and the Vafio tomb and the Mycenaean palace and the Menelaon, you know, fortunately the Bronze Age levels published by Hector Catling before he passed away. How, this, how these different sites in the region actually functioned. And I think that's gonna be a very exciting um, avenue of research, I think in future areas. Um, this networking, John, is uh, this network, I would say, is, uh, is very important uh, for the interpretation of uh, the development of Sparta too, uh, because uh, in the, especially in the sixth century, you have a, a, a power. So um, uh, this uh, development from late Bronze Age to the late uh, archaic times uh, indicates that uh, yeah, this, uh, the societies, uh, there is a, transi a transition phase for the societies. Mm -hmm but still uh, with newcomers and the, the locals. We have a very nice question from Professor Gostel. Um, how can one visit the site? Will the new finds be exhibited in, um, the, in, in Sparta? In a few years, yes, at the New Ecological <laughs> Museum of Sparta, sponsored by the Stavros Niarchos Foundation too. In the fullness of proverbial time, as we say, um, we have another question um, uh, that's directed to Vicky. Hello. Well, I was wondering whether Vicky could talk a little bit more about the ash altar uh, from the late bronze into the early Iron Age. What was found below the 6th century BC altar? That well, was Deborah is... Cusunielos. Yes, thank you, Deborah. But um, it's really very difficult to, to say these are only layers that were um, uh, identified by Tsundas, the first excavation of the hill, then by the German excavators. I think uh, Stavros also has uh, traced some patches also of these uh, layers, but this is so mixed and uh, destroyed by later activity on the hill. We have seen that it was used uh, until late antiquity continuously. So it's very difficult to, to trace exactly the limits of this uh, ash uh, layer, and also to, to reconstruct uh, uh, with, um, with detail the, the earlier center, let's say, of the, of the cult. 
we imagine that it must have been an unsheltered because of these patches of, uh, of debris and uh, in comparison to other uh, early cult places that we have uh, almost the same, uh, the same idea. But as you know, for uh, earlier phases, we only left with uh, material deposits and some uh, very mixed layers to, to play with. <laughs> so. <laughs> It is indeed a, a, a vexed question because of the, you know, how extensively the site was excavated, both by Christos Suntas and later by the Germans. And um, so, you know, I, I, I was, I was, you know, delighted to see um, so many wonderful results, um, you know, from a site that had been so carefully picked over um, by some of the giants of, of classical archaeology and gene prehistory. So we're getting many, many notes of thanks to you both. Um, thank you both for a wonderful presentation. Um, and everybody, please join me in, in thanking our speakers uh, for, this, for this wonderful overview of a very important um, sanctuary.